All right, well, good morning, everybody. As Dr. Crosby mentioned, my name is Brendan Delbos. I am the uh, superintendent of the state fish hatchery system here at the Department of Wildlife Resources. Appreciate everyone on uh, taking the time to log on today. And uh, thanks to you, Dr. Crosby, for the invite. Uh, happy to be able to participate with you all today. So for the next, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, I'd like to discuss perhaps three of the most common questions that I receive from budding trout farmers. Number one, what permits are required to raise fish in Virginia? Two, where can juvenile fish be purchased from? And number three, how do I properly transport live fish to or from my facility? So my goal here today is to simply provide you with some practical info on all three of these topics and hopefully, you know, get you pointed in the right direction. Okay. All right, so before we get into the specifics of today's presentation, I'd like to give you a little background info on the aquaculture program here at the Department of Wildlife Resources. People are often surprised to learn that DWR is actually the second largest producer of fish in the Commonwealth, second only to Blue Ridge Aquaculture, which is a large tilapia producer located in Martinsville. So the DWR fish hatchery system were comprised of a total of nine independent facilities. Five of them specialize in the production of brook, brown, rainbow trout, and four are dedicated warm water facilities where we raise temperate species such as walleye, muskie, striped bass, sunfish. We have a team of about 45 men and women that work in the hatchery system, and we require about $4 million annually to maintain operations at all nine facilities. Now, the money to operate the fish hatchery system primarily comes from the sales of fishing licenses, and we have about 500,000 people who purchase a fishing license every year in the state. Additional funding for the program comes through the sales of fishing gear, boat registration, and I, I like people to know that DWR Hatchery System is one of the few state agency that creates and provides a product for the public and that many of the fisheries throughout the state simply would not exist without the intervention of DWR Hatcheries. All right, since we're focusing on trout production today, here are just a few more details regarding trout production and stocking program here at DWR. As I mentioned, we have five cold water hatcheries. Uh, they're all located in the western part of the state. You can see their locations indicated by the gold stars on the map. And you can see the regions of the state that each hatchery stocks. We produce and stock about 1 million trout per year into almost 200 individual waters. And every year we make over 1,300 stocking trips and our fleet of stocking trucks cover about 140,000 miles every year to deliver fish to the waters throughout the state of Virginia. All right, we have about 100,000 people that fish for wild or stock trout in Virginia every year. And the majority of the trout that we produce go into what we call our put and take waters. So this is where we put in stocked catchable sized trout and the anglers take them out, put and take. This type of fishery represents about 90% of the waters that we stock in Virginia. Here in the state, a trout stamp, in addition to a fish license, is required to fish these waters. And the department also operates three fee fishing areas at Clinch Mountain, Crooked Creek, and Douthat State Park. And we also stock seven waters that are located in urban settings in the eastern part of the state. They're represented by the black dots on the map. And this is a very popular program for us as it allows us to provide the public with the experience of trout fishing without having to make the distance, the long distance travel to the western part of the state. All right, let's shift gears a little bit, get into the details of today's presentation. Let's start with transportation of live fish. Okay, so just like when we're growing or raising fish on our farms, the primary goal when we're transporting live fish is to simply do one thing minimize stress, okay? It's not enough to simply keep our fish alive because we know that stressed fish will not perform well. They often come up with diseases. We see reduced growth, okay? So we have to do everything that we can to understand the unique chemical, biological, physical requirements of the species that we're working with 
And then we have to do our best to meet these needs in a cost effective manner. Okay, and again, similar to growing fish, we're gonna come across three main factors that are gonna dictate the health of our fish and how well they handle transportation. Okay, so we have chemical factors, which we typically lump into a group we call water quality. Things like temperature, the presence or absence of dissolved gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, the pH and mineral content of your water uh, are, are very important and perhaps the most important water quality parameters to consider when transporting live fish. And uh, we'll discuss uh, specifics for trout here on the next slide. Next, we have biological factors, such as the size, age, or reproductive status of your fish. For example, we know that one pound of juvenile fish consume more oxygen than one pound of adult fish. So we might need to make adjustments in our transportation protocols when we're working with fingerlings. And although it might seem obvious, uh, we need to make sure that our fish are disease and stress-free prior to harvest and transportation. And then finally, we have physical factors such as loading density, which is the weight of fish per volume of water. Proper circulation or mixing of water within the transport tank can be an important factor. And then of course, the design of the actual transport tank itself can have a direct effect on how well our fish do during that transport. All right, so now if we get into some specific transport guidelines for trout, the first and most important factor to make sure is that you have access to clean, chlorine-free water for filling your transport tank. Well water is often a, a good choice uh, as long as it's free of excess metals and dissolved gases. Uh, after that, the next most important factor for successful transport is temperature, water temperature. Water temperature has a direct effect on oxygen consumption, fish metabolism, and production of waste products. Trout are, of course, a cold water species, so the optimal hauling temp is going to be between 45 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, next we have oxygen, and we want to make sure that the oxygen levels stay at or slightly above saturation. Proper dissolved oxygen levels can be maintained by one of two ways, either using pure oxygen or aeration. However, the, the choice of, of your oxygen source is going to have a direct effect on how much fish we can actually put in the tank, or it's going to affect that loading density. Okay, we also want to be careful that when we're, if we're using pure oxygen, to make sure that the oxygen levels don't get too high, as this can upset the gas balance of the blood within the fish. All right, next we have mineral content. And most species of freshwater fish are going to benefit from having a small amount of salt within the water. This aids in osmoregulation. And depending on your water source and the length of trip, you might be looking to add approximately 4 to 20 grams of salt per gallon of hauling water. Uh, solar or evaporated salt in some cases can be a good choice, as often they'll add just a little bit of calcium. And this can be beneficial, especially if you're hauling trout in soft water. Uh, here at DWR, we generally don't use a whole lot of salt when we're hauling our trout, simply because the vast majority of trips that we take are under three hours in duration. But you will find that most private companies that are hauling trout over long distances, uh, they do in fact report a benefit to the health of their fish by utilizing that salt addition. All right, next we have loading density. And this is simply how many pounds of fish can we haul in our tank, right? And as I alluded to before, you know, when we're using pure oxygen, we can greatly increase that loading density. And uh, here at DWR, we're typically hauling our trout at up to about two and a half pounds of fish per gallon of water. I would advise you guys, uh, if, you're, if you're new to this process, to start at, at roughly half of that, you know, maybe start at about a pound per gallon until you can become more familiar with the system. You know, you can learn to uh, understand how your fish react. But, um, you know, under ideal conditions, certainly hitting 2.5 pounds per gallon of water is, is not, uh, is not uh, out of the ordinary for sure. Um, however, if you're using aeration through a compressor or maybe a paddle wheel aerator, the transfer of oxygen from the air to the water is limited. So we can only haul about a quarter pound of fish per gallon of water in that case. Uh, keep in mind, these numbers are for adult fish, 
So if we're hauling juvenile fish or fingerlings, we may need to uh, reduce these numbers by half, depending on uh, local conditions and depending on your experience. All right, a few other rules of thumb here to keep in mind when transporting live fish. Uh, there are a number of commercially available additives that can be added to your transport water. Uh, water conditioners, pH buffers, sedatives, these can all be used on longer trips. Uh, you just want to make sure that if you're using these products, that they're approved for use if you're raising your fish to be consumed. Uh, next, uh, it's very important when we're hauling or transporting fish that we withhold feed from the fish. The general rule of thumb here is to stop feeding them for 24 to 72 hours prior to that harvest and transport. And this is going to help lower the metabolism, oxygen consumption, and uh, it's going to result in less uh, waste buildup in your transport tank. And finally, just remember that the goal before, during, after transport is to minimize stress. And one way to do that is to minimize any major differences that you might see in the water quality between the, the holding water and the receiving water. Okay, and so uh, the, the, uh, again, the rule of thumb here that I like to give folks is that if the temperature of your receiving water is five degrees Fahrenheit or greater difference, or if you have a pH difference greater than one pH unit, again, between your transport tank and your receiving water, I always recommend that you temper your fish by slowly adding that receiving water into your transport tank over the course of about 30 minutes or more. And that'll allow the fish uh, just you know, a short amount of time to adjust to those new conditions. It's gonna minimize stress and minimize that shock that, that the fish might otherwise experience. All right, moving right along. So let's talk about the importance of tank design. Hauling tanks, of course, come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, materials. Plastic, fiberglass, and aluminum are the most commonly used because they're durable, they're easy to clean. We can sterilize them in between hauling runs. Most tanks that you come across are gonna be square or rectangular, but round tanks can certainly be effective as well. You know, it's always nice to have a custom built transportation truck like you see in the upper picture. The reality is, however, that we have to work within our budgets. And frankly, most of us are never gonna have a need for such specialized equipment. So the good news is that nearly any vessel can be transformed into a transportation tank. Again, as long as we meet those, those chemical, those biological, physical requirements of the fish that we talked about uh, uh, just a minute or two ago. So as long as that tank holds water, it can be used to haul fish. But there are a few specific design features that you can incorporate into your transfer tank that are going to help minimize stress on your fish and on you. All right, so here are uh, a couple of suggestions that, uh, that you might want to consider before you either purchase or design your own live haul tank. So here we have a picture of one of our uh, live haul tanks here that the department owns. And again, you know, most of us won't have the need or the funding for a setup like this, but there are some key design features here that I'd like to point out that again can be applied to, to almost any tank that you're working with. All right, first, uh, this particular uh, live haul tank is divided into multiple compartments. This allows us to ship fish of different sizes, species, without having to mix them into one container. Additionally, when stocking fish, having the multiple compartments um, allows us, we can load each individual compartment with fish for a particular location. And this is going to greatly improve unloading time and it's going to greatly reduce the amount of stress that the fish experience during that offloading period. Uh, and next, I like that this tank is insulated and this is great, particularly during the uh, warmer months when we're hauling our trout. This tank uh, also has a watertight and splash proof design through the use of properly fitting lids, latches, watertight seals. You know, we want to make sure that both our fish and water stay within the tank. Keep in mind, though, that the tank is not airtight. We want to be able to allow gas exchange from the water to the air. So, for example, carbon dioxide does not build up to harmful levels within the tank itself. And although it's a little difficult to see on this particular picture, 
This tank has dedicated ports for both aerators and oxygen lines for each individual compartment. Uh, you can see them located along the top of the tank on the right hand side. Um, so, you know, having something like this in place is going to help to secure that equipment and it's going to help to keep the cords organized. It's going to help to uh, minimize tripping hazards, for example. And uh, although you can't see it here, this truck also has a support to secure an oxygen bottle just behind the cab at the front of the truck bed. Uh, it's very important, you know, of course, if you're using oxygen bottles that you secure them properly uh, to your vehicle. This tank uh, has dedicated ports for loading and unloading fish. Each compartment has a lid at the top of the tank for easy loading and then a smaller eight inch port at the bottom for offloading. This offloading port can be connected to a large diameter hose to aid in directing fish to their final destination. This type of offloading port not only simplifies the process, but makes it less stressful on the fish compared to using a net. Next, I like that there's ample space on each side of the tank for personnel to safely move around and access the tank from all sides. And uh, although this might be somewhat obvious, having a vehicle that's properly sized for your hauling tank is critical. You know, keep in mind, water's obviously very heavy, We're on the order of about eight pounds per gallon. This particular tank that you see in the picture is a thousand gallon tank split into four compartments. So, uh, you know, easily 8,000 pounds uh, just in water weight that we're, that we're transporting. So that water weight can add up pretty quickly and, you know, make sure that the vehicle you're using is, is sized appropriately for that haul. All right, so that is live haul guidelines for trout in a nutshell. Let's shift gears here quickly to DWR aquaculture permits. And uh, so there are going to be three types of aquaculture related permits that we require here at DWR. We have the hold and sell for commercial use permit, the possess, propagate and sell again for commercial use. And then finally, we have an importation permit for exotic species. In the vast majority of cases for small aqua farmers, the hold and sell permit will be the only permit re required by DWR for your operation. Uh, however, you know, if you intend to either propagate or breed your fish, or, you know, maybe you plan to get involved with live fish stockings, you're going to need the uh, possess, propagate, and sell permit. And the importation of exotic species permit is really only going to come into play if you're working with a non-native species such as tilapia. In this case, there are certain design features that you'd need to incorporate into your system to prevent accidental release of fish into the wild. Uh, all of our permits are available online on our website that you see at the bottom of the page. And uh, of course, we have dedicated staff that specialize in the permitting process. And they, you know, they'd be, do a fantastic job. They'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have about these permits or uh, you know, simply hold your hand and walk you through the process. Cost of the permits is around $10 each for an aquaculture facility and uh, $50 if you're operating a fee fishing area. Uh, just keep in mind that there might be other re permits required either from VDACs or DEQ. Uh, and this is gonna depend on the size of your operation, how many pounds of fish you're producing and whether or not you're processing and selling your fish as food. Right, moving right along. Next we have sources of trout. So currently we've got about roughly a dozen trout, culper, trout culture operations here in the Commonwealth. Some facilities operate more as fee fishing areas, whereas others operate as a, a more traditional fish farm. And I'm not really in a position to recommend one company over the other. I have listed here for your reference a few trout operations that I'm familiar with personally. Uh, for those of you that are new to the field, new to trout farming, I would recommend that you reach out to these companies, uh, you know, not only as a potential source of fish, but as a, as a source of information, right? Um, yeah, I think you'll find that most trout farmers, particularly in Virginia, for whatever reason, are very happy to, to work with outsiders and to share their experiences. Not in every case, of course, but I think you'll find as a group, they're pretty welcoming and, and a pretty, pretty helpful crowd. 
Uh, I will say for the record that the Virginia Trout Company, they're probably your most reliable in-state supplier of juvenile fish, uh, simply because they're the largest private producer, trout producer in the state. But there are also, you know, many quality trout producers in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, North Carolina, that would be happy, you know, to assist and, and to deliver fish to your facility. Um, you'll notice here that I've also listed Trout Lodge, which is located in Washington State. They're a producer of high quality trout eggs. So if you're looking to, to uh, if you're looking to go uh, with eggs as opposed to fingerlings, they're going to be your go-to source. We use them here at DWR on occasion at, at a couple of our facilities. And that not only do they produce a great product, uh, but they have a great website with, it's full of lots of useful information. And I will just add here that uh, regardless of where you end up getting your trout, I really encourage you to request a fish health certificate from the producer. This is going to show that your fish have been tested by a, by a health professional and that they're free of major, what we call reportable diseases. Okay, and this is, this is not something that's required by the Commonwealth. Um, it's certainly not a, a regulation for fish anyway uh, through DWR. But, you know, this is going to help to make sure that we're not spreading fish diseases throughout the state. And it also helps to protect you and protect your investment that you have in these fish by ensuring that, that again, these fish are free of reportable diseases. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for uh, participating in today's workshop. Uh, you can, whoops, get that back. You can see my uh, contact info here. If there's anything I can help you guys with in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, certainly, if you're interested in learning more about our state hatchery system, you can check us out online. Uh, during, during a normal year, our facilities, our nine trout hatcheries, our nine fish hatcheries are open to the public and, and we love to have the public come in, conduct tours, provide a little education and, and you know, just, just let the public know what's going on um, in terms of uh, aquaculture production at DWR. Unfortunately, with COVID-19, we're, we're temporarily uh, uh, shutting down the hatcheries to the public, but we are producing fish uh, as usual and uh, uh, hope you all uh, take advantage of some of the great fishing opportunities that we have in the Commonwealth. And again, if there's anything I can do for you all in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you all very much. Brendan, that was very informative. I always learn a little bit about everything, every time I listen to the different talks. Um, I think one of the things that we need to realize if we're gonna transport, most of our folks are gonna be transporting maybe about 500 fish to their farms for their cages. Mm -hmm, sure. So, you know, this information should be very critical for you to pay attention to if you decide to try to move some small uh, numbers of fish to your place. Uh, many of these hatcheries will will deliver them to you, uh, but there's a cost, but they will guarantee them to be most of the time be live when they get there. But if you pick them up and take them to your place, there's no guarantee. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point, David. Do we have? Yeah. Now, uh, gentlemen, the only questions we have in uh, the chat box is about the slides, and I answered that. And uh, also, I know Dr. Crosby mentioned this at the beginning. We will, we are recording this, and it will need to be edited and closed captioned, and then we'll put it up on the YouTube channel for your viewing. Uh, but uh, it's going to take us several days, could take up to a couple of weeks because a lot of these programs are being recorded in closed caption. So uh, there are opportunities. So. Okay. Okay. Okay, Brent, thank you. Uh, let's probably move on to the next talk so we can have questions at the end. You know, we'll stay here as long as you want us to be here, even though we do plan just for an hour program, but we're more than happy to, to answer any question as long as it takes. Okay, let's, let's start the old screen sharing. I'm using my old... Okay. Okay. 
I'm going to talk about trout production for cages uh, because, you know, we have a lot of uh, farm ponds. Next slide. Okay, you know, there's a lot of different farm ponds. In 1985, you know, there's supposed to have been about 80,000 farm ponds. And many of them are quite suitable for cage aquaculture. And believe it or not, we can raise uh, trout, even over here at Virginia State, in cages and ponds during the winter because the temperatures do get cold enough to hold trout. I'm not sure if Dr. we lost Dr. Crosby or not. Yeah, he might have just uh, lost audio for a moment. Or we all have an, we're go. all having we're we're all having internet problems this morning. The only one I didn't have it was DWR because <laughs> I'm sure Brendan was in his office. Okay, next slide there if we can. Okay, here you go. Okay. Okay, rainbow trout. We already talked about this is going to be our choice animal fish for our cages. Uh, they're very plentiful and we have a lot of different places in the state that we can purchase this to stock our cages. Next slide, please. Uh, what we're going to be talking about, we're going to talk a little bit about the biology, production method, cage construction, feeding, water quality, and diseases. Next slide. Okay. Why rainbow trout? They're fairly easy to raise. You know, market potential, if you want to sell these, are fairly high. There's a good market for in the way of food and sport. Uh, many people want it for food. And we can get them up some is, you know, at half pound to a pound and a half. Most of the time we're going to be shooting for a pound, pound and a half when we raise them in cages. So uh, market potential for these guys are, are good. And not only that, you can raise them just for your own use. Uh, forget about uh, selling them. Uh, what better way than to raise a cage or two of trout in your uh, pond during the winter and the summertime and the spring, take them out and process it for your, for your own use. Next slide. Um, biology, they, they spawn in the spring and fall. Different strains can produce up to uh, 500 to, to 10,000 eggs, depending on the size of the female. Eggs usually hatch within 24 to 31 days. Temperature, 50 to 55. And they like to be in some kind of substrate uh, most common production of these uh, fish are usually in raceways and pens or cages. Next slide. Uh, temperature for growing, 50 to 60 is fairly good. Uh, spawning, again, it's in the low 50s, mid 50s. But the real kicker here is that uh, trout don't like temperatures above 70 degrees. Once you hit 70, you're going to have some very serious issues with these fish and they can die. So if, when you're raising them, uh, as the spring approach, you need to monitor the weather and the temperature of the water to make sure you don't hit that 70 degree uh, mark for very long. Uh, feed requirement, they require a much higher protein diet, which makes it a little bit more expensive. Uh, and there's also uh, feed that's uh, formulated just for trout. So you would look for a formulated feed for growing your rainbow trouts. You want to look at the size of pellets. And basically we're looking at 12 to 15% fat. A lot of the proteins come from fish meal. Next slide. Okay, quickly, uh, just overview of, of spawning. You know, we collect the eggs and, and uh, semen, we mix it, we put it in hatching trays, the little fry hatch out, then we raise a little fry, and they go into production system raceways, and after about a year or two, they're ready to go. 
just a real quick overview. Next slide. Okay, water sources. What's going to be the water source for your pond? It could be a spring, could be a well, or even from from a river. But most of our ponds are going to be watershed. So we want to make sure that the pond we put in there, our trout into the cages that we're going to use in that pond, that pond is will maintain its uh, uh, fullness uh, during the winter time. We don't want to see it uh, get too low because once you put those cages in, you don't want to get so low in that pond where the cages are actually touching the bottom. Next slide. Okay. Again, uh, what kind of watershed do we have? Forest versus pasture it takes a lot more watershed to keep a pond filled if you got forest land versus pasture. Uh, if we got limestone deposit, that's a real plus for growing trout. Uh, they do like a uh, good alkalinity water, hardness in the water, uh, to maintain proper pH. Uh, the void fills with manure. Uh, you don't want that stuff going in because that's a nutrient load for the pond. We don't want to get too much nutrients. We won't, don't want our water to be uh, have too much uh, total dissolved solids in it. The trout likes clear water. They like clean water. Next slide, please. Okay, production methods, uh, cages, raceway ponds, and tanks. We're going to just talk mainly about cages because cages are, are easy to build, easy to maintain, and easy to harvest and feed your fish and stock out. Uh, I wouldn't do cage culture of trout unless I had a pier to put my cages on to make life simple. So let's focus on cages. Next slide. Okay, different type of cages. This Doc, we lost you. Doc, we lost you. You're going to have to go over your cage information again. Yeah, go ahead and go to the uh, the slide I'm showing here is a uh, old slide of some store bought cages with metal tops. You just show you cage culture has been around. These were cages that we started off with back here at Virginia State when I got here. Next slide. Yeah, you cage production. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, ponds with cages. Uh, here's an example of somebody uh, had a small pond and they strung out the uh, cages out in the middle. And you, when you do something like this, you got to have to have a boat to get out there. At least one thing that's positive about this slide is that they have aeration that allows circulation of water into the cages. Remember, we need to have oxygen in these cages. The cages become a microecology system. Uh, with the fish in there without water moving into it, they can use up the oxygen in those cages. Uh, just because your cage has holes in it doesn't mean water really passes very freely through it. Next slide. Okay, cage construction. I like round cages. They're simple to build. Uh, they're basically four by four. You're going to use some kind of uh, plastic uh, polypropylene plastic net with about a half inch mesh. You're going to need at least 13 feet in width for that and you're going to need four foot for the tops. Uh, when I do the tops, I prefer a three quarter inch mesh for the tops because that allows the feed to fall much more freely into the cage and for the bottom I go with a half inch. Then around the top of the cage, I put a smaller mesh netting on the inside. And the reason for this is to keep the feed from leaving because we're going to use a floating feed. And once this feed gets in there, if we don't have this smaller mesh uh, netting at around the top of the cage, we're going to result in feed leaving the cage and not getting the feed into the fish. Next cage. Okay, here are some examples. You can use uh, swimming pool noodles uh, swimming noodles to hold your cage. This design is a fairly decent one. 
because it's a half top where you can open up half the half the lid it keeps it more secure again uh, you want some fruit Wow, it's really having trouble. You would not like that at all. Next slide. We, we, you dropped that at the end of that. Oh. The past one. Did you repeat the last one? Uh, this, Dwayne, you know, as soon as I start talking and there's a, uh, these are half cage, half top designs where you can just open up half the uh, top of it. And this makes it a more secure cage to keep uh, critters from getting into it. Again, the freeboard is pretty important between the, uh, the top of the cage and the, and the water level. You want at least four to six inches between the surface of the water and the top of the cage because if you get it too low, you may get some critters that want to go in go into your cage and that will not be nice. Next slide. Okay. Cage construction, you're going to need some poly tube, three quarter inch with connectors. You're going to need some uh, floats, some bracing material, aquatic ecosystem. You can still call a number, but I never get anybody to answer for me anymore but they still seem to have a website. But this is where some of the places we can get some materials to build cages. Next slide. Okay, various designs. Uh, you know, you can make them square, round. Uh, as again, it shows a little bit. Uh, we have a little flotation device around the cage using the larger PVC pipe. This helps keep your cages a little bit more separated. You don't want your cages up against each other and also can aid in supporting and keeping other critters out. Again, cage designs are all sorts. Here's somebody designed a cage with a little DC pump that pumps water into the cage uh, while hanging it off there, but you need that DC pump. Next slide, next slide please. Okay, this just shows you how old these things are for building. These are plans that were developed over 25 years ago. And it was just showing a simple uh, means of uh, building a simple round cage. We have uh, greatly modified those plans since those days uh, using a, a better top system than was indicated in this. Next slide. Again, uh, just to remember, uh, you're going to have to have some floats, some bracing materials. Uh, the netting material comes in 50 foot rolls. Uh, so, you know, you can do a lot of cages with a couple of 50, uh, 50 foot rolls of uh, polypropylene plastic netting. And it's fairly easy to uh, calculate. Next slide. Okay, this is showing us uh, building some cages. You know, we roll out the uh, netting material for the sides. We're measuring the length of our netting here to do the sides. Uh, different kind of floats here. We got some uh, uh, commercial floats you can use. Example, what the mesh looks like. Uh, we're showing you how to make a top there. That's polypropylene uh, netting material half inch, we're building the bottom there. The pipe is three quarter inch. It's round four feet in diameter on that. Next slide. Okay, things you're gonna need to do this with, you're gonna need some tin snips, pliers, hacksaw, leather gloves, goggles, heat gun. The heat gun is used uh, to put the uh, three quarter inch uh, poly two pipes together with the three quarter inch connectors. This work, this is probably the best thing to use for connecting that. Over the years, we've used things like propane uh, torches and try to use glycerin and just pure uh, muscle strain. But uh, the heat gun is probably one of the best uh, ways of connecting your uh, poly tubes together. Maybe a PVC pipe cutter and a tape major at least 16 feet in. Uh, in measurement. Next slide. Okay. Again, just some examples. 
uh, showing you, uh, the, I'm just showing measurement of the distance between on the top, which is really four feet. The total length of the, the uh, poly tube is actually uh, circumference of 12 and a half feet. The circumference of this is 12 and a half feet. Uh, different cages for here I'm showing on, um, on channel six, I was showing folks how to build a cage. This is just a roll of material uh, that we were using. Next slide. Again, uh, some math is involved, you know, to get circumference, how many feet that you're going to need to get your four foot diameter. This is the formula that would you use, two pi r, to get the, the length of pipe that you would need to make the rings to make the round cage. Next slide. Okay, here we go. If you want to calculate the cylinder volume, the volume of your cage, again, it's pi r squared plus the height that gives you the volume that you need, how many cubic feet of water is going to be in your cage. And usually we stock fish by cubic feet of water in a cage. Next slide. Okay, here we go. We got some trout. We want to go out and buy some. What do we buy? What size do we want to get? and how many we want to put in a cage. And basically a four by four round cage is usually what we're looking at. Usually we want to start off with a fish that's about three to four fish per pound. And you know, you're going to be running about seven to nine inches in these fish. They grade them pretty well, but that's the size you want to put in there. Uh, we probably don't want to do more than eight to 10 fish per cubic foot of water in a four foot round cage. We want to put about 250 fish that works very well. We want to stock them in those cages probably about the end of October, early November, because we want to make sure that our water temperatures are going down, not going up. So we don't hit that 70 degree mark that will uh, cause uh, stress on our trout and cause problems with fungus growing on them and even killing them. Next slide. Again, uh, here's an example of trout production in a five acre pond. You can see we got some aerators. And if you look closely, you see some uh, PVC pipes uh, coming up over into a cage. We're using an airlift uh, system. I got some more examples of that. But you can see you can, in a small situation we've got up here, we can have quite a few cages of trout uh, for raised for production. Next slide. Uh, here we get somebody's tethers their cages out there. I don't recommend doing something like this because it requires you to get out on a boat to go out there and take care of your cages. I prefer you to use a pier for, uh, for your cages for stocking, feeding, and harvesting. Next slide. Okay, here's an example of what I call an airlift pump. This is something you might want to think about to improve the water quality in your and your system. So again, your cage has fish in there, even though it has holes in it, your water movement into the cage is important. With an airlift pump, you can actually pull water from outside the cage and put it into the cage itself, always refreshing and putting clean outside pond water into the cage. Next slide. Here's some examples of what, what you're doing with. You can see we got a cage with a half lid here uh, with uh, commercial floats on the side. Uh, look for commercial floats. The reason for that is these things are PVC uh, resistant and they can last for many years. Swim pool, uh, swimming noodles won't last more than a season or two. Uh, here, you know, we're using an airlift pump going into the PVC pipe on the outside, pumping air in there, and we're putting water into the cage. This is a far more uh, efficient way of exchanging water in your cages, and it ensures that you're pulling clean water from outside into the cage. Next slide. Some more examples. You probably want to have a manifold to do this with to get this water into the cage. And have the uh, outlet uh, almost at water level. Next slide. Just more examples showing a hookup. We have an air, uh, air pump in this uh, container here to protect it from the environment. We're running a 
a uh, half half inch uh, uh, reinforced PVC tubing to a manifold that's going into our cages. Basically, you pump air, creates bubbles, pushes the water up into the cage. Pretty ingenious, simple system. And I think that's something you should look at if you're gonna do something like this. Next slide. Okay, uh, site selection free cages. Uh, typically, you probably want a one acre pond. That's always good. Uh, you probably want to have some kind of electrical outlets nearby to put some aeration. Remember, just because a cage has holes in it, it doesn't mean water is going to get in there fairly easy. Uh, we also want to have it uh, in a situation where it's easy to get to uh, for feeding and harvesting those fish. Another thing is some kind of security. It's, um, it's amazing uh, how cages of fish can disappear uh, out of the middle of nowhere. I've known whole cages get, uh, fish get stolen out of it. And you would think the only way they knew there was a cage is they had to know about it. Uh, a pier, a dock, we want at least a couple of feet between each of our cages. And probably most important, we want to probably a two foot, two feet clearance between the bottom of the cage and the bottom of the pond. We don't want that cage sitting on the bottom of the pond with our crowd. Next slide. Again, here's some examples of somebody with a, another pier with square cages. This is a more expensive design, has a lot more PVC. Here's an example of what not to do. Somebody stuck a cage in a, in a stream and unfortunately the first uh, heavy rainfall came through, took away the cages. Again, when you get ready for stocking your cages, you know, fish coming in live is very important. Uh, again, if you go, uh, you may want to look at cost of transportation from your hatchery to your cages to ensure they get there in one uh, alive. If you do it yourself, you might not get them there alive, and then you'd be responsible for dead fish, not the uh, fish hatchery. Next slide. Okay, some stocking rates, a four by four round cage, you can get anywhere from 250 to 400. And again, if you go to a big cage, like a rectangular cage, 12 by 14 uh, and four feet in depth, you know, you're talking about 1,500 to 2,300 fish in that cage. You have to remember, more fish you put in a cage, the more risk you're taking because you can have a lot of fish dead in one cage. So the four foot round cages is what I recommend people start off with and around 250 trout in those cages. Next slide. Okay, again, uh, three to four fish per pound, I've got to emphasize that, 250 uh, late October. Uh, again, you know, start off with a, with a uh, fairly decent sized fish. You're not going to start with a very small fish. If you put a smaller size uh, trout in your cages, it's going to take you much longer. You're not going to get up to size by, uh, by April. April is when we're looking at trying to get these out. Next slide. Okay. Uh, here's an example. I'm just showing this example. This is a simple one acre pond and this pond has been very successful raising trout in there. You can see a nice little uh, pier, two cages, got a nice metal uh, garbage can to put the feed in, got a net, uh, and you can grow about 250, 300 trout in this situation. Uh, again, we want to take it harvest by mid-April. We want to feed every day we can. Uh, we're going to use a half inch mesh for the cage, and we need to watch the water temperature because around April, we don't want that water temperature hit 70 degrees on us and stay there. And we're going to see a bunch of dead uh, trout or a bunch of trout with fungus. Next slide. Okay, just other examples of uh, production system, uh, raceways. That's real commercial like. We're not going to worry about that. Next slide. Ponds, you may have a pond that you might want to stock out for winter trout uh, 
production for a fee fishing operation during the uh, spring before water temperature comes out. So you may be using ponds. But again, once water temperatures in the pond get above 70 degrees, your trout will die. Next slide. Uh, some people have tried aquaponics, uh, holding trout in aquaponics. Again, you got to have cold water uh, to keep them in there. Next slide. Again, feeding, high protein diet. This is typically what we use in most of our cages, the 38 to 40. Again, you want to start off a small floating pellet, maybe about 332 to start them off with because you got to make sure that the trout can get the pellet and use it. We always we always use a volumetric measurement for feeding. So we use some kind of cup to uh, feed our trout to keep up uh, uh, the uh, measurements of how much feed we give each day. Next slide. Again, uh, we have a, a, a good feed guides for trout and there's more detailed ones than this one. This one gives you an idea what the feed uh, your trout based on temperature. Uh, you can see when it's about 56 to 63 we're feeding about 3% of body weight and by percent body weight we're talking about how much uh, feed we give by multiplying the percentage of weight of our fish in a gauge. If we had um, uh, 100 pounds, we multiply that by 3%, we're talking about three pounds a day. And we want to feed seven, we want to feed as much as we can. Even when we get down to 40 degrees, we can still get some feeding, but we're not feeding as much. We're feeding at a much reduced rate. We're only feeding about three or four times a week. So the, the point here, we got to feed to get them up. And the more we feed, the more feed we get into them, the quicker we're going to get the size that we want. Next slide. Again, uh, secure container with your feed. Here we got a measuring cup. You should uh, weigh out uh, uh, what a cup of feed weighs so you can calculate uh, how much feed you want to give each day based on their percent body weight. Next slide, please. Again, you may, may want to put an automatic feeder in there. Again, when Next slide, please. Oh, Doc, would you mind going over this one again? Oh, this one? Okay, sorry. It was just, you cut out for a moment. I, I didn't see my internet disappear on me. Uh, this has a demand feeder that holds some feed. It's got a bunch of fingerlings around there. It has a little wire that comes down, and they can bump this wire and drop feed into the water when they're hungry. What happens a lot of times is that fish will hang around here and we get some that get smart enough to know if they keep bumping this wire they get fed so they're always some always sitting in this wire to get feed because some of them get uh, um, like to consume a lot more feed than they really need next slide okay again good quality feed this is just an example of catfish feed 32 percent protein quarter inch again we got to size our pellets to the size of fish mouth you know if you get too big a pellet that goes in the mouth of the fish they're not going to eat and you're going to have problems next slide again water quality we talked about that uh, trout are very sensitive to nitrites uh, nitrites can get in the blood don't take much nitrites in the water cause a problem but most of the time we're not going to have problems in our in our uh, ponds in that situation. Oxygen level, make sure we got plenty of uh, uh, open space so water can circulate. A little aerator pushing water into your cages is nice. We like to have our total dissolved solids pretty low. We like to see some alkalinity in the water, at least 20, 30 parts of hardness in the water. We uh, pH 
normal six and a half to seven and a half, and water temperatures below 70. Next slide. Aerators, again, you want something, uh, if you're doing a lot of cages, you want something to push that water around into the cage. Even in the wintertime, it's important because this allows to keep your ponds uh, ice free. You know, if you don't have something like this, you can have uh, ice, your pond can ice up all the way to the cage. The cage may be remain open because the activity of fish in there, but I've seen cages without aeration actually freeze over. We don't want that. So uh, we might want to look at having an aerator help us water and keep our, our ponds ice free. Next, next slide. Okay. Oxygen levels, you know, we want to keep it high, at least five or above. And the good thing about wintertime is that the water is much colder. Colder water can hold more oxygen than warmer water. So we're in good shape most of the time in winter because the ability of the, ox of the gases uh, can be uh, held at a higher level because of the temperature of the water. Next slide. Okay, uh, things that we got to worry about sometimes if we got a high production level discharging into streams or whatever, you might need a DEQ uh, permit for that. There is some regulations we already talked about. If you plan to sell these, uh, you may have to have a permit uh, for a, a stock and things like that nature. Next slide. Again, uh, what kind of markets? You know where your market is if you plan to sell these. So think about that before you start buying your first trout, especially if you think you want to sell these fish. Next time, next slide. You know, okay. this is just a graph of showing uh, production and price of fish. Uh, the uh, amount of trout uh, is not too bad. It's remained stable over the years. Next slide. Uh, here is a process. If you plan to do a processing of your fish, basically with trout, if you're planning to sell it, you're trying to avoid uh, certain uh, further processing regulations, the best way to sell your trout is live on ice. In other words, uh, you tell folks, I got some trout in my cage. Uh, you know, on selling them so much per pound live. Do you want some? They come to your place, you dip out your trout out of the cage, you put it in a bag on ice, and you sell it. Now, if you plan to do any kind of further processing, you're going to need a facility. And this is an example of a trout, a, a fish processing facility that was built uh, in Gloucester. Uh, you can see very clean, washable walls three uh, compartment sinks place to process. Everything can be washed down. Uh, you're gonna need to be inspected by VDAX in order to have uh, further processing. So you make sure that your facility meets their standards to uh, process fish in that particular area. It's not that hard. Uh, these folks did it with no problem. You, they will tell you they're pretty easy to work with. And if something's not right, they'll tell you what it is and you just correct it. Um, and Mark, this is what, next slide, we need to go to our processing video. You know, we have a short two minute video that we want to show here. Here we go. Okay, I'm not, we're not getting any, we're not getting sound on this. You can see they entered in through the annual area and just making a slit all the way towards the end. And then they go make a slit underneath the mouth. Go right there where, the, where those grooves are. You just go put it in there and bring the knife up. 
I'm not getting any sound on this. Then he's just going to put his finger in there and just pull it completely back. Oh, yeah. You want me to play it again? I think the sound was off. Yeah, I was, I was trying to do a dialogue on it. Yeah, let's, let's try to get the sound on it. He was telling pretty good. You want me to restart it? Yeah, just restart it. It's only okay. a two-minute video. All right, let me see if this... Uh, I think there's another sound control. Uh, one second. A couple different methods on how to clean your catch. Can you hear that? You see here, yeah, I hear. Trout. So the first thing you're going to do, you're going to pick up the trout, lift him up, and turn him upside down. You're then going to take your knife and insert it into the vent area, and you're going to just start slicing uh, vertically up towards his jaw, and you're just going to go right up the belly, and all the way up to where the jaw comes in and makes this B right in this general area right here. You're going to go all the way up. Then you can go ahead and look closely, and you can see the slits underneath the jaw of the fish, you're going to slide your knife through the slits and just slice all the way up. You're then going to reach up, put your finger in below the jaw, and you're going to grab the jaw in one hand and lift and pull with the other. And that is going to remove all of the guts from the fish. Once you have the guts out, you can see the only thing remaining is a little bit of the air bladder, uh, maybe some of the eggs or milk left over in the fish, and then you're going to have a uh, kidney that runs right along the back there. And now you can see what's remaining is just the kidney of the fish, and you just get in there, you can use a spoon, you can use a lot of trout, you can just use your fingernail, and you're going to uh, push that kidney out and use your fingernail to scrape it out and then you're just going to use water to rinse it out. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Get out there, catch some fish, and enjoy eating them. Mark, I gotta take a little break here real quick. I'll be right back. Okay, sure. Oh, just one moment, Dr. Crosby. Okay, I think Doc uh, answered the questions about the depth of the pond, about the six feet and that kind of thing. So I think those questions that are on there have been answered already. So um, if there's any more questions, you can put them in the chat box. And Mark, could you go ahead and put the link to the survey, uh, to the evaluation in the chat box as well for folks? Oh, sure. Can do. Thank you. Uh -oh. Yeah, there it is. Okay. We certainly appreciate everybody being here. Okay. And uh, there he is. I'm back. So, I'm sorry okay. for the break, break I had to do. Okay, we can get back and finish this up. We're getting close.
Okay. Are you, you want to go back to the presentation? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. Just, Here we go. Okay. Just real quick. We'll just go through this pretty quick here. Next slide. Again, if you go do some processing for your own use, you might think about vacuum packing your fish, you know, flying them, or even packing them whole gutted into a vacuum pack for your own use, or for sale if you get a VDAX permit. Next slide. Again, you gotta look at your market. What can you do? You know, this is a, always an end market eating your fish in a nice uh, flavorful lemon, lemon pepper grilled trout is great to have. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what's your market for these things? Right now, you go to the supermarket, what are you paying for a trout? Uh, wing was, I think I seen 10.99 a pound, 95. Next slide here. Again, end product, eating it. Now that's what you're looking at, how to get your fish from, from your pond into this form and make some profit. Next slide. Again, if you go look at selling this, you gotta have a market. You gotta think about a couple of things here. You know, what is gonna be the cost of production per pound? If you had uh, about 400 pounds in your cage, you go roughly get around 100 pounds worth of fillets. Uh, you have to look at the cost of your fingerlings, cost of the feed, how much is going involved in processing your cost and processing the fish. And you have to look at uh, cost plus what you go charge per pound. If you were trying to uh, make 15,000 uh, dollars on your thing, you would need really three dollars plus cost in 50 cages. And I said, Big Miz is selling rainbow flies at 10.95. So if you're looking at a fly market, you know, you gotta look at how much money you wanna make. I put 15,000, you could be $1,500, you know, as a small uh, farmer uh, market niche marketing aspect. Next slide. Again, uh, you got cages and Believe it or not, uh, Doc, we lost you again. You need to talk about predators again. Doc, we lost you. You need to talk a little bit about predators. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, again, here's a cage. And we have a fish eating bird on here, a great blue heron. They actually can poke into the cage sometimes and actually cause lesions on your fish. I know that the Department of Wildlife Resources, many of their hatcheries with raceways had to totally enclose a raceway to keep great blue herons from coming in. They were getting 30 to 50 at a time coming in on their place. Uh, and that's a lot of blue herons. I've never seen that many blue herons together. I've seen, you know, half a dozen together, but not that many. Okay. But again, you got to worry about these kind of things. Otters might get into your cages and things like that nature. So you got to like, and if you got to like, you're going to have the uh, action of uh, animals that like fish too. So keep an eye on that because you don't want all your profits to be consumed by a wildlife predator. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Uh, again, uh, fish can die, it doesn't matter whether it's trout, tilapia, bluegills, catfish, they can all die in a cage and have problems. Next slide. Uh, there are diseases of the trout. Uh, Brendan uh, referred to reportable diseases. Uh, virus is one of the things that we look for in trout. Most trout are inspected for this.
don't want to sell the VC. Doc, you might want to talk about diseases again. You cut out. Oh, gosh, it don't like me today. Okay. Uh, trout diseases, we mentioned earlier that you might have want to have a facility that gets inspected for viruses, protozoan parasites, bacterial diseases. Uh, this is an example of a trout that's showing a whirling disease, which is uh, produced by a protozoan type parasite uh, that causes this type of problem. You know, tails all curved or a fish that looks like this might be a diseased fish. You want to avoid these kind of fish, but most of our producers do have their fish inspected because they want to make sure they're not transporting any diseases around because sick fish don't make money. Next slide. The main thing you got to worry about is your trout getting fungus. Here's a trout that's getting towards the uh, end of spring. Temperatures are climbing in 70. One thing that you go look for uh, that's going to be problematic if you allow your temperatures to get above 70 is you go get fungus on your trout. And that's going to be a problem. You can't sell fish looking like that. So watch those water temperatures because fungus is going to be a problem towards the end of production season. Next slide. Again, keep records. Uh, that's pretty critical. You know, you got to put down when you stock them, what the weights are, what size. Look at the harvest weights, the number of fish you're harvesting, the size of fish you're harvesting. So keep some records. Next slide. Okay, think safety. Again, here we got cages tethered out in a boat, no life preserver on. Well, I've actually had people actually drown because of this situation. So that's the reason I always emphasize use a pier free cages. And also, these cages are almost at water, are at water level. Uh, not a real good cage design. Next slide. Okay, that's it. We're done. Okay, Doc, you do have a question. Sure. Um, okay, th this person has a spring fed flow, which is about three feet deep, five feet wide, and 50 feet long. Would it be possible to build a shallow, long cage for this environment, maybe two feet deep, three foot wide, eight foot long? It would be for raising fish for personal use. I think you probably do that just for personal use. I would like to see what it looks like before we did that, you know, because, you know, three feet deep, yeah, you know, I want to see what it looks like. You can probably get away with it, you know. But I would like to see what it looks like first. Yeah, you probably have to do some intensive management on that as well. Well, yeah, it depends on water flow, you know. You know, it, it sounds like you might look at some kind of raceway situation here. And that's what we would have to look at uh, because you need at least an 18 inch drop from raceway to raceway to get some oxygen on that. So uh, that's, a, it could be possible, but I would like to see what it looks like before we made any decisions. That's the only one that I have in there. You've already answered the one about the six foot depth and um, you know, how far from the bottom would you put the, oh, how far would you put the, um, how far from the bottom would you put the airline for air lift? Oh, it, it, it's uh, ten, uh, the um, the PVC pipe is only about three and a half feet wide, a length, and it's only about seven to eight inches from the bottom of the bottom of the pipe. On that, it doesn't go all the way to the end. It comes up. If you look at the bottom of the pipe that goes in the water, I'll come up six, seven inches, insert a barb for the airline to push the water up. Okay, and Mark's putting the survey in, and uh, okay. I don't see any additional questions. Okay, okay, okay. I apologize for the uh, inner out. As you can tell, Doc has some connectivity issues. 
I don't, I don't know why I would have it because I, my my computer sits right next to the Wi-Fi, so it's not a problem communicate, not distance. It's just uh, overloading the system. Mash buy more bandwidth. <laughs> I don't know if that would solve the issue or not, but I apologize for that. Again, I thank everybody coming. Brendan, I thank you for coming. My pleasure, anytime. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be calling on you. We got this uh, pond management 101 we're talking about developing here soon. Sounds good, happy to help. Okay, great. Hey great. Mark, could you put the links in for the ones that are already up on the YouTube channel? Um, if folks are interested in going and looking at those. Please. Oh, okay. The, Thank um, you. Th if you just go to our channel, yeah, I'll put the link to the channel. Some of them are still not uh, ready yet, but there are a few that are ready. So I'll put that up. So in case some of our visitors today are interested in seeing some of the previous ones that are done. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is it. Okay, so if you go to that channel, it will show you the ones that are, uh, that have already been put, uh, that have been processed, that have all of the, um, the subtitles and everything and the, the branding. Yeah. The other ones are still in the pipeline. Yeah, it takes a little while to get those things closed captioned. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be difficult if I keep cutting out every time I'm talking. Well, maybe you could do um, like Michelle does and you, you can call in with your phone. It might be something we can try. Doc, there's another one about uh, a person wants to learn about the, I guess it's the triploid grass carp for algae management. Uh, we actually did do a weed program a while back, but I'm not sure it's up yet. But grass carp like, and Doc can add more to this, but grass, the triploid grass carp like the weeds that are submerged and algae is a floater. They don't, that is probably not one of their favorite foods. Yeah, uh, yeah. He can explain that better than I can. Yeah, I would say usually the size of grass carp that we get was not going to do any kind of algae management. The uh, very small ones will eat some He keeps breaking out on us, but as I said earlier, they don't like the floaters and they don't like um, the emerged weeds, the ones that actually come out of the water. So, okay, yeah. you're back. Oh, I'm back again. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is getting kind of crazy. Um, the grass carp, the reason we use grass carp of 10 inches or or so in size is because we got largemouth bass in a pond. If we use smaller grass carp that probably would eat some of the algae, the uh, bass would just uh, snarf up every uh, grass carp you put in there. And since you're paying close to 10 to $15 a uh, piece nowadays for them, that'd be a pretty expensive uh, bass food. And the larger grass carp don't eat algae they eat the other things uh they love things like hydrilla things of that nature soft succulent plants they're very picky. they can be very picky eaters so you know you know if they have nothing else to eat they may try it you know you know like uh, water lilies they may nibble on the roots stuff like that but they not they don't eat everything but they're good to have because they keep certain plants down Okay, there's some information in here. Um, they have one of those 80s, 1980s built ponds just for personal use. Dad called the Israeli carp. We had two huge ones die this year. Have okay. not had an algae problem and like would like to keep it that way, spring fed ponds. Okay, uh, well, the, the Israeli carp might have been in there since 1980. Um, 
I think, you know, as long as you're doing what you're doing, you're fine. Uh, you know, what you probably want to do is have the water checked for alkalinity, hardness, and pH, see what that looks like. That would be one thing I would look at. And do you need to replace them? Not really. You don't need to replace the really carp. Okay, anything else? That's all I've seen so okay. far. Okay. Okay, I thank everybody for coming. Okay, and just check our YouTube channel in uh, two weeks or so. We hope to have this up there and then you can uh, you can watch it again. Yeah, watch me go in and out of voice. <laughs> oh, Lord, okay. Okay. The link to the YouTube channel oh. is up, is in the chat box if you'll scroll up just a little bit yeah. above your questions. It, uh, Susan, it in, yeah. it's there. Yeah. Okay. There we go, it's in. And he just put it in a second time. Mm hmm Well, if not, we're going to... I hope I'm back again. Yes, you are. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, if we don't have any more questions, I guess we can just go ahead and end it. And you can always contact us or send us emails for questions. And Brendan, if you could send a copy to uh, Mark so we can uh, put that in our resources for agents.